you know, when the disciples were in a lockdown mode, not as a result of a virus, but as a result of fear, uh, the gospel writers tell us that Jesus appeared to them. And so I've been praying that in these days of lockdown and isolation, that uh, each of us may have a special sense of the presence of the Lord Jesus with us as we turn to the scriptures, that they might be alive for us and that we might keep looking to the one who has promised never to leave us or forsake us. Be assured that we are praying for you as you pray for us. Let's keep looking up. We're used to seeing warning signs on the road if there's a traffic hazard ahead, but are we alert to the warning signs of spiritual danger as we continue on our journey? Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg helps us heed the red flags in our Christian life so we can stay the course. He's titled this message, Holding Firmly to the End. We're in Hebrews chapter 3. Is there then a way for me to be able to detect the early warning signs of my heart growing cold and my commitment beginning to wane? The answer is yes. And again, I found recourse to Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the most helpful answer of all. And let me tell you the way in which Bunyan identified a number of factors in relationship to the coldness of unbelief and the hardening of the heart of an individual. This is what he said. Number one, he said... In a, in a life that is beginning to wane in its commitment and grow cold in its interest, there will be a forgetfulness of God and a forgetfulness of the fact that one day we're going to meet him. A forgetfulness of God and the fact that we're one day going to meet him. It's a dreadful thing, says uh, the writer to the Hebrews in chapter ten thirty one. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And when you or I are about to embark on a passage or a time of disobedience and declension, one of the things that we will find ourselves endeavoring to do is to close down any notion of the fact that we will one day have to deal with God in relationship to what we're about to do. Secondly, there will be a gradual loss of private holiness, private prayer, the curbing of our lusts, and sorrow for our sins. Private a gradual loss of private holiness, private prayer, the curbing of lust, and genuine sorrow for our sins. Just a sort of onset of laziness. Thirdly, we will find that we begin to avoid the company of lively Christians. We won't be concerned about being around half-dead Christians, because if we are concerned to be half-dead ourselves, then the company of the, the graveyard will be quite soothing to our expectations. But lively Christians we will avoid, because they will always appear to be fanatical. And in Christian terms, a fanatic is always someone who loves Jesus more than I love him. A fanatic is someone who leaves a track to the end of the meal, if that's an embarrassment to me. A a fanatic is someone who is always zealous for these things and always wants to talk about Jesus. Fourthly, there will be a disinterest in public worship. That doesn't mean that we won't attend public worship, just that there will be a disinterest in public worship, that we will become like those of whom Jesus spoke in Matthew 15, uh, those who drew near with their lips, but their hearts were far from me. Fifthly, that there will be a picking of faults in others. When you or I begin to manifest fault-finding, finding planks in everybody's eye, it's usually an indication that there's something wrong at another level. Now, that's not because there's nothing in the lives of others with which we can find fault. Goodness knows there's plenty. But you see, when we've taken the first directive, which is to fix our thoughts on Jesus and to guard our own hearts, then we're going to be taking care of the big two-by-fours that are sticking out of our eyes rather than ferreting around looking for toothpicks in other people's experiences. But when the heart begins to harden 
And when unbelief begins to take hold, there will be the picking of faults in others. Then there will be association with the godless. The staying away from lively Christians and more and more associating with the godless. Now, this may not necessarily be in hanging out with them in terms of immediate association in their presence. It may be simply taking their counsel, standing in their way, sitting in their seats. Psalm 1, right? Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scoffers. Suddenly our interest becomes far more in the reading of trashy magazines. It would be far more interested in watching lousy movies. We are far more interested in hearing what the godless have to say about certain things. And we certainly can't stand it now when we're around these lively Christians. And possibly and probably there will be actually the seeking out of these old associations, and you'll find yourself turning up at the doors of people whom you left behind when you set off for the heavenly city. When you find yourself going back there, and the deception of our own hearts is such that we may even convince our minds that the reason we're going back is because we're going to evangelize them. It's usually a lie of the devil. When we find ourselves driving down those same streets, making those old journeys, we got a major problem. Seventhly, we will be involved in fleshly lusts in secret. Secret sins will begin to hold us in their grip. Ephesians 5, 12. Eighthly, we will begin to play with sin openly. Suddenly, we become more and more brazen as our hearts become harder and harder. We become like those of whom Jeremiah speaks in Jeremiah 8, 12. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. They'll drive up in their cars, and they'll look you full in the face. They'll introduce their adulterous relationships to you in the mall. What will happen to them? They will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when they are punished, says the Lord. And ninthly, being hardened, we will eventually reveal to all the sorry condition of our lives. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, the Spirit clearly says that in the later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. He's not talking about people in the realm of paganism. He is talking about people who were part of the professing faithful and who departed by degrees from the truth of God's Word. I don't know about you, loved ones, but if the rehearsing of that list doesn't cause you to examine your own heart, then you're probably in greater peril than you even realize. Murray McShane, who died, the Presbyterian minister in St. Peter's Dundee, who died at the age of 29, says in his writings, I have found the seeds of every sin dwelling in my heart. And therefore, the warning of verse 12, the second directive, guard your heart, is a necessary warning. See to it, he says, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Lord, I don't want to have one of those hearts. Lord, I want to know you, to live my life to show you all the love I owe you. I want to be a seeker of your heart. Lord, I don't want to stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scoffers. I want my delight to be in the law of the Lord, and I want to learn to meditate on your law day and night. I want today to hear your voice. You see the great danger of presumption and complacency and how such a notion is rattled and helpfully so by this second directive. Well, let's come to the third and final one, which is in verse 13. First of all, in verse 1, fix your thoughts. Then in verse 12, guard your hearts. And then in verse 13, encourage each other. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You see this great emphasis again on today. What have we done today in this matter? 
to be of help and encouragement to one another. Listen to Philip's paraphrase. Help each other to stand firm in the faith every day, while it is still called today. And beware that none of you becomes deaf and blind to God through the delusive glamour of sin. That puts it very clearly. Beware that you don't become deaf or blind to God because sin seems so wonderfully attractive. And notice the emphasis. The emphasis is on the responsibility that we have for one another. You see how this all ties together. We are his brothers and sisters. We have been made members of his family. We are the holy brothers and sisters. We have received a heavenly calling. This is what marks us out. Therefore, we should fix our thoughts on Jesus. Therefore, it is imperative that we guard our hearts so that we don't wander and fall from the way. And therefore, it is only sensible that we would watch out for one another and encourage one another. Each of us has been in a situation where if it hadn't been for somebody else watching out for us, we would have been in real difficulty. All kinds of things, you know, in in a factory with a piece of machinery moving around. And if it hadn't been for one of the guys on the shop floor that said, Hey, George! And we went like that, the thing would have taken our heads off. And we were thankful, and we said to him afterwards, Hey, thanks for watching for me. I missed that completely. That's the principle here watching for one another. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Am I my sister's watcher? Yes. Does this mean nosiness and interference? No. What does it mean? It means consideration and care and recognizing that none of us lives to ourselves or dies to ourselves. Our lives are like coals in a fireplace. Get the tongs, take one piece of coal, lay it on the hearth, and watch as it quickly begins to go out, as it loses all of its fire and all of its warmth and all of its flame while the rest of the coals that are all snuggled up to one another burn brightly. Take a piece of coal that has been isolated from all the others, and it is dead and it is dark, and put it into the midst of that, and watch it catch the heat from the coals around it, and watch it begin to mingle with the flame. That's why it's so important that we're doing what the Bible says in relationship to our care and our concern for one another. We're avoiding the company of Christians, when our hearts are becoming hardened, when unbelief is beginning to filter into our minds, but we're going to be seeking out lively Christians when we have a genuine hunger for God's Word. That's why He's made us all so different. That's why He's made the parts of the body and has used the body as a wonderful illustration of our relationships with each other. The body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of a body. If the whole body were an eye, where, how would it be able to hear? And if the whole body were an ear, how would it be able to smell if you burnt the dinner? But in fact, God has put the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body, and the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you, and one part to the other, I don't need you. We all need each other. I mean, this isn't rocket science. We all need each other. And the encouragement that comes on the lateral level from one another is part of the provision of God to ensure that we do not become like those who died in the wilderness. That's why it is important for us to seek out the company of one another, why it is important for us to be involved in small groups with one another, why it is important that in the large worshiping experience of God's people, we go beyond that and find for ourselves at some level of involvement at Parkside Church in the realm of service, in the realm of fellowship, in the realm of worship and praise and singing and music, when parking, whatever it might be, that there is that dimension to our lives where we know that there are people who are watching out for us so that they are genuinely encouraging each other. You see, because when it comes to the issue of sin's deceitful approaches, all of us have blind spots. Therefore, it is important that there are those who are genuinely and consistently watching out for us. Now, you notice that the word is encourage one another. In other words, there should be that about our relationships with each other, which is marked by care and by comfort, which strengthens so that when a crisis emerges, we're able to hold firmly to the end. On the occasions when I go to the exercise club, when I can pluck up the courage to do so, there is one particular individual who's been there now for some months. His name is Mark. 
he looks like he comes from a completely different species than, uh, than anything I have ever known, do know, or will ever know. When he punches that bag on the wall, it just ricochets off his hands, and he can go for 25 minutes and never stops. But when he comes around to help the likes of me, he's a wonderful chap. It's embarrassing, actually, how encouraging he is. You know, when, you, when you're lifting these weights that are less than the, than the average 12-year-old in the room, and he is standing with you, and he is giving these words of encouragement, you've either got to conclude that the guy is full of hot air, or he's a genuine encourager, that he's always there to spot you, he's always there to strengthen you, and he's always there... He just comes up, as it were, from nowhere to give you a tip to prevent you from doing the exercise in the wrong way. Because it would be of no benefit to you. He's a wonderful fellow. He comes around, not from the top down to shout and scream, but he just appears from nowhere and always from alongside to encourage and to help. I'd like to be like him. We need people like Mark in our lives. And those of us who think we don't need them more than we realize. And there are people around us in every experience who, if we are to play the part that God has intended for us, will be in need of our word of encouragement, however menial it may appear, however inconsequential we might think it to be. You will never know how much a word of encouragement may mean. A scribble of a note, yes, with your lousy handwriting, yes, with the stationery that didn't match the envelope, Yes, the coffee in the cup that did have a chip just by the handle. Did you ever, ever meet anybody who was in need of an encouragement, who complained because the envelope didn't match the paper? Never, never. Says Calvin, unless our faith be now and then raised up, it will lie prostrate. Unless it is warmed, it will be frozen. Unless it is roused, it will grow torpid. Sounds a little like Calvin, doesn't it? In other words, let's remember Philemon. You, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Solomon's words, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Now, you don't need to think very hard to realize that the implication and application of this is straightforward. As sin approaches us, exaggerating its appeal, exaggerating the satisfaction that it has to offer, we need to beware lest we are blinded by its attractive glow. We need to beware lest we close our minds to the reality of God's retribution. And we need to be thankful that God has put others around us to say, hey, look out. Put others in our path so that we might consider in relationship to each other's lives how we may spur one another on to love and to good deeds. That's Hebrews 10 and uh, 24. Now, dear ones, this isn't a matter of marginal importance, because by these very means, the writer says, many hearts will be prevented from hardening. Many will be encouraged to stay true to the end of the journey. And why is it important? Because it is only those who stay true to the end of the journey and only those who finish the course that will gain the prize. When you travel in France, every so often you come on these grave sites that seem to stretch from the point of entry way into the horizon just rows and rows and rows and rows of tombstones. It's virtually impossible to drive your car past. It's so monolithic. You have to stop and sit and think. Stop and sit 
and think about verse 17. With whom was God angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? Some 600,000 tombstones. Says Lenski, the Lutheran commentator, what a long, long line of graves, the saddest in the world. They came out of the bondage of Egypt under faithful Moses, but they fell as corpses in the wilderness. And so, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Holding firmly to the end. That's our subject today on Truth For Life as we continue our study in the book of Hebrews. Alistair Begg returns in a minute to share a closing prayer, so please keep listening. But first, I want to mention some exciting updates we've recently made to the Truth For Life mobile app. If you're listening to a program on the app, it now holds your place so you can come back later and pick up where you left off in the message. The app is just one of the many free resources made possible with your support of this ministry. When you give a donation, you're helping more people have access to Alistair's clear, relevant Bible teaching. And when you give, we'll say thanks by sending you an elegant new edition of a beloved classic book, The Pilgrim's Progress. For centuries, this timeless work, written by Puritan author John Bunyan, has won the hearts of readers seeking to encourage us to stay on the road to salvation. It's the story of Christian and his journey to the celestial city, and it provides insight and wisdom for our own journey of faith. This is one book you'll want to keep in your library to revisit for years to come. Request your copy when you give online at truthforlife.org slash donate or mention The Pilgrim's Progress when you donate by calling 888-588-7884. Now here's Alistair to close with prayer. Oh God, our Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. We pray that anything in the voice of a man that diminishes the clarity and the piercing nature of it may be lost to our recollection, and only that which is clearly from yourself may be retained. We pray earnestly for some tonight whom we know once walked with us and whose hearts have become unbelieving, whose hearts are becoming hardened, the kind of hardening that can still sing the songs play the tunes, and live in a flat-out denial of that which is true. We earnestly pray that, like the prodigal of old, they may be brought to their senses, and that they will arise and head back to say, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and that they might be gathered up in your embrace. We pray that you will make us a congregation that is genuinely interested in winning back the wanderers, that you will make us sensitive to the allure of sin within our own lives so that we may fix our thoughts on Jesus, that we may guard our hearts so that they don't become sinful and unbelieving, and that we will encourage each other as long as it's called today so that others will come to believe and to follow and to journey on and to stay the course and to sing your song. Hear the cries that come from our individual lives tonight. As some of us, as it were, erect an altar to mark this particular day as the day in which you, O God, in your mercy arrested our drift corrected our wanderings, broke our hearts, and restored our souls. And listen as some of us cry out to you with gratitude for the way that you have watched and preserved and protected and provided for us down through so many days 
and through so many difficulties, and yet you've remained faithful. We worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you can come back Friday for a message titled, Rest for Your Souls, as we continue our study in the book of Hebrews. This daily program features the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg. It's furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.